Have you ever wondered about the Great White Throne Judgment? It's a concept that has fascinated theologians and spiritual seekers for centuries. This judgment, often referred to as the Final Judgment, holds a significant place in Christian theology and the chronology of the biblical end times. Following the millennial reign of Christ, after the tragic end of the Gog and Magog War, and the dragon's brief but deceptive return, we find ourselves at the threshold of the Great White Throne Judgment. Imagine a throne, radiant in its whiteness, symbolizing purity, righteousness, and justice. And upon this throne sits the one who will judge all of humanity. This judgment is not just a mere event, it's a culmination of a grand narrative. A narrative that began with creation, meandered through the fall of man, the incarnation of Christ, his crucifixion and resurrection, and the millennial reign. Now we find ourselves at the end of this narrative where every action, every choice, every deed is accounted for. What makes the Great White Throne Judgment so significant? It is here that the dead, both small and great, stand before God. The books are opened, including the Book of Life. It is a moment of reckoning where each person is judged according to their deeds. The sea gives up its dead, death and Hades yield their captives, all stand before the throne awaiting judgment. But this judgment is not arbitrary or capricious. It is based on the things written in the books, a testament to divine justice. Here there is no favoritism, no bias, only the impartial judgment of the one who sits on the throne. Those whose names are not found in the Book of Life are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, a spiritual death, a final separation from God. This is the final judgment, the moment when all are accountable for their actions and choices. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? Yet it underscores the urgency of faith, the importance of choices, and the profound reality of divine justice. As we delve deeper into the mysteries of the great white throne judgment in the coming scenes, let's remember this. Our choices matter, for they echo into eternity. As the millennial reign of Christ concludes, a dragon is released. This dragon, a symbol of deception and destruction, sets out on a mission to deceive the nations. Its charm is so alluring and its words so persuasive that it successfully convinces millions to join its cause. These misguided souls, led by the dragon, attempt to overthrow Jesus from his seat in Jerusalem. Yet as they gather in numbers as vast as the grains of sand by the sea, their plot is foiled. Fire descends from heaven, consuming them in an instant, a divine intervention that leaves no room for retaliation. This grand deception ends in the blink of an eye, and the dragon, who is none other than Satan himself, is swiftly thrown into the lake of fire. This lake, already home to the false prophet and the Antichrist, becomes the eternal dwelling place of the dragon. With the dragon banished, it is time for the Great White Throne Judgment. Now comes the moment of judgment as Jesus takes the throne. The celestial court is called to order, and with a voice that echoes through eternity, Jesus commands, Arise, O dead, and present yourselves. Suddenly the sea gives up its dead, and death and Hades themselves yield their captives. This is a resurrection unlike any other, a gathering of every soul that ever lived and died without knowing Christ. In this moment, the books are opened. These are no ordinary books. They contain the record of every thought, word and deed of those standing before the throne. Every secret whisper, every hidden act, every solitary thought is laid bare before the eyes of him who sits on the throne. Another book is open too, the Book of Life. It's a roll call of those who, during their mortal lives, chose to follow Christ to accept his gift of salvation. Their names are inscribed in this book, a testament of their faith, and a guarantee of eternal life. The judgment begins. Each person, small or great, is judged according to their works. The way they lived on earth plays out before them, a vivid testament to their choices and actions. The judgment is fair, just, and without bias. Every opportunity given, every chance taken or squandered, every choice to do good or evil is considered. Those whose names are found in the Book of Life are spared, but for the rest, a grim fate awaits. They are cast into the lake of fire, the second death, it's a fate worse than any earthly demise, a place of torment and despair. It's a destiny they chose, through their rejection of Christ and his offer of salvation. Each person is judged according to their works and those not found in the book of life, face a grim fate. This is the great white throne judgment, a time of reckoning, a time of justice, a time of truth. It's a moment that underscores the importance of the choices we make during our earthly lives. This is the second death, a spiritual death that follows physical death. 
In the grand scheme of divine judgment, the physical death is merely the beginning. It is the cessation of the heartbeat, the silence of breath, the dimming of the eyes. However, the second death, as described in the scriptures, is a spiritual one, an eternal separation from the divine presence of God. This is a death that transcends the physical realm and delves into the spiritual, the eternal. You see, after the great white throne judgment, the fate of the resurrected dead is sealed. Those whose names are not found in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire, a place of perpetual torment and separation from God. This is not a physical lake as we understand it, but a spiritual one, a place where the soul is deprived of divine light, love and life. It is a place of existential anguish, a place of eternal regret. This second death is not a cessation of existence but a perpetual state of being, a state marked by the absence of God's presence. It is the ultimate consequence of rejecting the offer of eternal life through Christ. It is the final destination for those who have chosen to live their lives independent of God, those who have rejected the divine call to reconciliation and redemption. In this second death, there is no resurrection, no reprieve, no second chances. It is a state of eternal separation, a state of perpetual torment. It is the final destination of those who have chosen to live their lives devoid of divine love and grace. This second death, this spiritual death, is a stark reminder of the gravity of our choices here on earth. It underscores the urgency of accepting the gift of eternal life through Christ, of living a life marked by love, grace, and submission to the divine will. For those whose names are not written in the book of life, this is their final destination. This is the second death, the eternal separation from God. It is a sobering reminder of the consequences of our choices, a clarion call to choose life, to choose Christ, to choose eternal life over the second death. In the aftermath of the judgment every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. This powerful moment reveals the undeniable truth of Christ's kingship, a truth that reverberates across the universe, echoing through the hearts of those who have accepted him, and striking a chilling note of finality for those who did not. In this grand panorama of the judgment, it's as if the world itself is holding its breath. The sea has released its dead, death and Hades have given up their captives, everyone, great and small, stands before the great white throne, their lives laid bare, the book of life is opened, and the names inscribed therein, are those who have accepted the grace of Christ. They, who gave their hearts to the Lord, will not face the second death, they have already passed from death to life. These individuals, the ones who chose to accept the love and sacrifice of Christ, are not mere spectators in this scene. They are participants, standing with Christ, their lives a testament to his mercy and love. These are the ones who have been given glorified bodies, who reigned with Christ for a thousand years, who will join him in this final act of justice. The great white throne judgment is not an arbitrary act of a vengeful deity. It is the ultimate expression of justice. Each person is judged according to their works, according to their choices, and everyone, even those facing the second death, will acknowledge the perfect justice of this judgment. They will see the record of their lives, and they will know that the judgment is fair and true. They will bow their knees, and they will confess that Jesus is Lord. This is a scene of profound sorrow and profound hope. Sorrow because there are those who have chosen to reject the love of Christ, who will face the second death. But it is also a scene of hope. Hope because it demonstrates the incredible love of Christ, who gave his life so that we could have the chance to choose life over death. The great white throne judgment is a stark reminder of the importance of our choices in this life. It underscores the eternal consequences of our decisions. It highlights the profound significance of the question, have you accepted the love and grace of Christ? Where will your name be found when the books are opened? As the heavens roll away, we are left with a stark reminder of the importance of our choices in this life. Until next time, consider this. Where will you stand in the great white throne judgment? For it is a question that echoes into eternity, a question that demands an answer, a question that ultimately we all must face.